everybody and welcome to the session. I hope that you all um, enjoyed the tour of PPPL that just occurred. Apologies for a little bit of a late start. Um, we had some technical difficulties. Um, I'm Crystal Bailey. I'm Head of Careers uh, and Director of the QIP. Um, and I am here today to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, Nadia Mason. Um, Nadia Mason is the Rosalind S. Yellow Professor of Physics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where she specializes in experimental studies of materials. She received her BS from Harvard University and her PhD from Stanford University, both in physics. Dr. Mason's research focuses on the electronic properties of small scale materials, such as nanoscale wires and automatic atomically thin membranes, excuse me. Her research is relevant to applications involving nanoscale and quantum computing elements. She currently serves as director of the Illinois Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, and also is founding director of the Illinois Materials Research Science and Engineering Center. Dr. Mason is currently chair of the American Physical Society Committee on Scientific Meetings and was recently appointed by President Biden to serve on the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee. In addition to maintaining a rigorous research program and teaching, Dr. Mason works to increase diversity in the physical sciences particularly through mentoring, and is former chair of the APS Committee on Minorities. Dr. Mason can also be seen promoting science on local TV at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry and in a TED Talk on scientific curiosity. Dr. Mason has been recognized for her work with numerous awards, including the 2009 Denise Denton Emerging Leader Award, the 2012 APS Maria Gopert Meyer Award, and the 2019 APS Boucher Award. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Mason. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a real great pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, I'm as, as chair of the Committee on Scientific Meetings, we've had a lot of discussions about in-person versus virtual. So I'm very, very happy to see this virtual meeting happening and people actually uh, joining us and being able to engage with the QIP conference this way. Um, you know, the word about the QIP conference, for me, this is, I've, I've attended many QIP conferences, had an opportunity to speak at many of them, and I really think that these conferences are, are, are among the most impactful conferences that I've been to. So I'm just very happy to be able to be uh, the overall speaker here and to, uh, to engage with it even further. Okay, so with that, let me share my slides. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I've been a physicist for almost 30 years now, and uh, I've learned a lot of things in all those years. Some I've learned the easy way and some I've learned the hard way. So I wanted to share with the people here um, what everything I've learned, um, but because I don't have a ton of time and we've even started a little bit late, I've condensed a really good fraction of what all the information I know into uh, this talk, which is entitled, What I Like About Physics and What I don't. Um, but the important part of the title is really here, which is why I really like it anyway. So in this talk, I'll say a little bit about my research. I'll just talk about one aspect of my research on flexible graphene devices. And then I'll say something about my own background uh, and then go into things I like about being a physicist, things I don't like about physicists, and just some general things I've learned along the way. Okay. So the research that I do is in what we call condensed matter experiment. Uh, I call it just the physics of stuff, really. Um, and the, what, I, you know, the, what I focus on is studying the fundamental electronics of very small devices, things that are nanometers or 10 to the minus nine uh, meters in size. To give you a sense of reference, a human hair is, is 10 to the minus six meters in size. This is a thousand times small, more, smaller than a human hair, for example. Um, you know, examples are things like carbon nanotubes, nanowires, graphene, we work on topological materials and nanoscale superconductors, for example. Now, the research question that we ask when we look at these materials is what happens electronically, meaning to the electrons, the interactions and behavior inside the material, when we shrink it down to these small scales. And you can think of this in terms of, you know, if you just have some bulk material, like a big chunk of gold, and let's assume you don't sell it because gold is worth a lot these days, but instead you put a multimeter on it and you measure its resistance, Anna, and you see that, you know, or, or the voltage across it or the current, and you see that the voltage current relationship just follows Ohm's law, V equals IR. 
That's what we expect of bulk materials like metals. On the other hand, you have single atoms where you know, if you take um, you know, senior year quantum mechanics in, 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 in college, you know that there's atomic shell filling and there are wave properties and there are all these really unusual properties that we associate with individual atoms and quantum mechanics. But now the question comes, what happens when you kind of bridge these two scales, when you have something that's nanoscale, nanometers across, which is really just like 10 atoms or 100 atoms across, so you can still see quantum mechanical and wave and other interesting properties, but it's big enough that you can put leads on it and measure its conductance. And this is where some really, really interesting physics come in, comes into play. Um, so it's, you know, you, you get to see new aspects of physics, but it's also relevant to making um, computers as we make them smaller and smaller, we have to start thinking about these sort of quantum mechanical properties and to making quantum devices like quantum computers themselves. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna focus on one particular nano device that we work on in my group, and this is graphene. Now I know many people have, um, look at the chat. Uh, many people have, have heard of graphene before. Um, it's, a, it's a single atomic layer of carbon. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing when you think about it, that if you take single atoms, right, and then just put them in a, in a grid like this, a hexagonal pattern, and try to stabilize them in air on the surface, it seems like they should just evaporate or disappear or crumple or something like that. But that's not what happens. They actually can be stabilized just on a substrate. Um, and this happens with, you know, with graphite, basically, you can take one graphite pencil, and then when you, the reason it writes so well is that the little particles slide across each other, like you see here, you get these little grains. And if you look more carefully under a microscope, you see that rather than grains, these are sheets that are layered on top of each other. Um, and then if you take these sheets and peel them out, across, peel them with tape and just keep peeling it and pressing, you know, peeling more and more and more, you eventually get the point where you get a single sheet of graphite. Um, called graphene. And uh, this is what um, Gaiman Novoselov did in, in 2003, I think, many, many, some, some years ago now. Um, but uh, you know, they, they won a Nobel Prize for isolating graphene and figuring out what its properties were. And I call this the, the cheapest Nobel Prize ever because it just really took a, a pencil and tape, something we all have in our drawers. So what do we do with the graphene in my lab if, you're, if we care about things like conductance? Well, we want to measure its properties as a function of some parameter. So we might measure the conductance as a function of, say, temperature or magnetic field or the size or just what happens when we vary it. And when we measure it, we really put it in almost the simplest circuit possible. Um, you know, when we think of the material like a resistor in a circuit, we just put a voltage across it and measure the current. Okay, and then we see if there's something interesting there, if it does anything beyond Ohm's law, for example. Or here's another schematic configuration where you have a sheet, say, of graphene, which is like our resistor. We put a voltage across it, measure the current, and then we also have a capacitively coupled gate, for example, that can change the energy levels. Um, and then usually we measure this. If you care about quantum properties, you want to measure at pretty low temperatures because then you can get rid of just kind of boring thermal effects. You know, temperature just heats things up, right? But if you want to see wave properties, you have to get it cold enough that you're not just being heated and mixed in things. So we put it in, say, a, um, a dilution refrigerator, which mixes, which pumps on helium three, an isotope of helium, to get things very, very cold near absolute zero. And uh, here's me with my um, dilution refrigerator when I was a in graduate school, very early in graduate school, so probably closer to much closer to your age than I than I than I am now. Here's a schematic, or actually an, an image of what an actual I think this is an optical image of a graphene device. You can see this this purple darker shade here is a single atomic sheet of carbon, and then we put electrical leads on it and measure its conductance. And just measuring conductivity versus, say, this gate voltage, you see this interesting V-shape here, which tells us that the conductance itself is tunable. But what's cool about this is that we can tune the conductance from high to low or positive to negative here with positive negative gates in an ultra thin device. And so this gives us possibilities for making switches or even you know, types of transistors or flexible materials in, in something that's ultra thin that we can tune the conductance in. It becomes a, it becomes a tunable electronic device, which is really useful for a lot of reasons. Um, and also graphene, just because of its thin properties, it's, it's useful for novel electronics. Um, it's also you know, very flexible. And I saw a note in the chat, please do uh, ask questions, just post any questions in the chat if, you, if you'd like, or we'll have time for questions at the end as well. But do post questions there, I'm, I'll be looking at the chat. There's a there's enough, few enough people that we can just answer questions as we, as we go through. Okay, so the other thing about graphene is that because it's very thin, um, it's also flexible. And you can understand this if you think of, you know, think of a thick book, 
right? And you try to bend that book and that's hard to do. Now think of a single sheet of paper, that single, you know, that single sheet of paper is flexible now just because it's thin. So graphene is not just highly conducting, but because it's ultra thin, it's also very flexible. And besides that, when you have things that are so thin, you can usually see through them, it's transparent. And because of the atomic structure of graphene, it's very strong. So suddenly we have this highly conducting, ultra thin, strong, flexible material, which gives us new possibilities for using it in things like flexible electronic devices. And so here's some examples here of flexible graphene transistors. Um, you know, you can make a flexible phone that doesn't break when you sit down, or at least feels more comfortable when you sit down and it doesn't fall out in the same way. So things like that are very useful. I think the real possibility is that these small flexible electronics can also interface better with our bodies. Our bodies are flexible, right? Our skin moves around. So if you want real electronic devices that can conform to us and, and be used for medical applications or for sensors that we might need on a re regular daily basis, we need these sort of flexible transistors, flexible, flex flexible materials to integrate into next generation of electronics. So that's why we wanna make graphene electronic flexible materials but before we get there, as a physicist, we wonder, okay, well, what happens, you know, if we can, we can just try to make these devices, but what if the electronics change when the graphene is bent or strained? In general, how do we know or how do we understand what happens, the electronic properties of graphene, when it's bent or strained? And this is important both for devices, but also from a fundamental physics point of view. Maybe, maybe we can even bend the graphene and get some new behaviors out of it entirely because it's such a thin structure that if we change the arrangement of atoms by bending it, maybe we also can get new behavior. And so that's the sort of thing that in my group, we've been looking at. How do these electronic properties change when the graphene is bent? So when we first started looking at this, we did, um, you know, we did the, the easiest thing possible. Well, for me, I just, it was sort of a lark. I was just interested in, in bent graphene. And so I did what uh, many professors do when they're, they're, not, they're not sure, you know, they, they just want to try out a project. I, I put it on an undergraduate for a summer. So I had an undergraduate uh, REU student and I said, okay, how about you just uh, try to pull the graphene apart, strain it in the most simple way possible, and then measure the conductance as it's strained and see what happens. So this, uh, this student did something great. He made this, uh, this little device. It looks, it's like a miniature version of a medieval stretcher. Um, you can see that it has clamps on either side and then a piece of rubber in between that we just drew grid marks onto. And then he pressed the graphene onto these grids and, uh, and then using a little mic micrometer just pulled apart these, uh, these clamps and stretched the material. Okay, so uh, the, the very, a very simple and you know, kind of intuitive way of stretching the graphene. Now, unfortunately, what happened when we did this is something that is also a little intuitive, is that we just observed the graphene as we stretched it, it just cracked. We formed cracks and they pulled apart. So, okay, that wasn't really what we were looking for in terms of new electronic behavior, um, but we actually saw something interesting. What we saw is that if you look at these images down here, um, A is where we start with the graphene, where we don't pull it, and then B is where we pull it apart, but then C is where we release the strain and put it back together again. And what you see is from B to C, it basically, you can't see the crack anymore. And indeed, when we measure the conductance of the graphene or the resistance, what we see is that it starts down here. And then we, when we strain it, it opens a crack, resistance increases. But when, when we release the strain, it goes back to where it started again. So um, this was actually really cool because you know the reason that graphene, you can't see the cracks anymore is because it's a 2D material. So it's like taking pieces of paper that you can pull it apart but when you put it together, it overlaps enough that you get almost the same properties again. And you can imagine if you took something like a pencil and then tried to push it back together, you wouldn't get the same behavior. You wouldn't get the resistance back and it wouldn't look the same. And so, um, you know, this showed us that graphene is actually very resilient to cracks and ripping and, and straining. That even if you strain it, it's not just gonna, it's not gonna keep ripping all the way. It'll just have a limited rip and then it'll close back to where it was. So this is useful in terms of making, you know, the resilience of future graphene devices. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a negative result, but it was also an interesting result. So it's making, it's making lemonade from lemons, right? And, I, and this is something to remember as you guys have, have your own talks and things in the future that even when projects seem like they, like they fail, like this one, it never, you know, they may not because you can still learn interesting things. Okay, but however, in this case, we didn't really want to look at cracks in graphene. We really wanted to look at the electronic properties of the graphene. So we moved on to a different way of inducing strain in these materials. 
So what we did next is we decided that if we could, um, instead of pulling the graphene apart, we could just take advantage of the fact that when graphene sticks to, when it sticks to a point, it, it, it sticks somewhere and it gets strained to the point where it's sticking, where it's pinned, and then it'll relax around that. So we end up making an array of nanoscale pyramids like this. We use lithography to make these pillars um, and then we sharpened them and then put on leads, put the graphene on top and the graphene stuck to these pillars and it was strained at the tip of these pillars and then it wasn't strained in between. So we made this strain array on top of graphene. And you can see the actual lithographic pillars here. This is, um, here's an array of these. Here's one, you can see the tip is about 20 nanometers. Here's graphene on top of the pillars. This is a hole in it. We just showed a hole so we could see the substrate and then the graphene here. And then here's the pattern of the graphene with electrical contacts. We can measure the resistance of this thing. Okay, so now we have an array of strain on the graphene and we wanna know, okay, first of all, you know, how do we know it's strained and then what does the resistance look like? Well, we know that it's strained by using what's called Raman spectroscopy. Uh, Raman spectroscopy is using light to excite vibrational modes of the material. And in this case, you know, graphene say has a mode that breathes in and out like this. Um, and you can imagine if the graphene is strained, the, the frequency, the resonant frequency of that mode will change if the graphene is strained. And it turns out that we can characterize how much strain there is by seeing how much that resonant frequency changes. And in fact, you hear what we have is this frequency, this resonant breathing frequencies of, of, of graphene. And if the change in the frequencies follows along this line, then we know that the graphene was strained. And here we have flat graphene, and here we have our patterned graphene, and you can see that it basically follows along this line, telling us that indeed our graphene on top of these nano patterns is strained. So that's great. We can induce global strain in the graphene. And then we can measure electrical resistance. And what we see in a 2D plot here is where red is the high resistance regions and blue is the low resistance regions. And we see areas of confinement in the graphene, right? These red regions show us that that resistance is high and the electrons are confined at certain values of energy, okay? And we believe that this confinement is also due to strain because we have this periodic strain pattern we're getting regions where electrons are basically localized around these, these strain peaks. So this was really interesting to us. We were very excited to see that we could control the behavior of electrons. We could get global strain in the graphene. Um, but we thought, okay, well, these pillars are, you know, they're kind of spaced far apart here. They're, you know, they're maybe, you know, mi microns apart here, not like a couple hundred nanometers apart. So we're not getting as much strain as we could because it's, you know, they're pretty widely spaced. What if we took just the tips of these pyramids and packed them as closely together as possible and then put graphene on that? And that's basically what we did. The tips of the pyramids you could consider as nanospheres, 20 nanometers in diameter. And we made an array of nanospheres, basically just spinning them on a chip and they close packed together and made a hexagonal array of spheres. And we put graphene on top of that and contacted it as you see here. And you can say, okay, how do we know if it's strained? Again, we looked at the Raman spectroscopy and we could see that the amount of strain that the graphene felt um, was related to the size of the nanoparticles it was pinned on top of, right? So when we have flat graphene, it's here. And then we look at the spectroscopy, we move along the strain line, we get increased strain for graphene on 200 nanometer nanospheres, increased strain for graphene on 150, and finally a lot of strain for graphene on 20 nanometer nanospheres. Okay, so this is great. We show we have global control of strain in graphene. And so now we measure the conductance of this device and we see really interesting behavior like um, energy gaps due to a, what we call a super lattice, which is a combination of a new, um, new lattice structure, a new um, sort of electronic band structure of, that's created between the graphene atoms and the nanospheres themselves. So we're actually changing the fundamental um, energies of this material, making it a combined material of nanospheres that induce strain and the graphene itself, again, controlling the electronics and we also see evidence of what we call pseudomagnetic fields. It turns out that if you strain graphene very locally, the electrons can behave as if they're in um, magnetic fields up to hundreds of Tesla, which is a huge field. Any real field this size, um, the magnet would just blow up at hundreds of Tesla. But in this case, because it's strained, the electrons move as if they're in a field that's like 50 Tesla on our devices. And we can see that again on a global scale in these strained nanosphere arrays. So, um, you know, this is the this is the conclusion of this part about the nanospheres. I'm happy to um, answer any questions you may have about it, though I can't see. Um, 
I don't think I can see the Zoom questions when they. Well, okay. If you have a question, just call out because it's hard for me to see the chat here right now. But um, but you know, the, what we see is that we can discover new new strain induced states and make novel electronic devices using strained graphene. And I should mention again that this is a project that I had a lot of undergraduates work on. Several undergraduates had papers coming out of this. And so I really love this project because it's interesting physics, but it also involves different levels of work and experience that um, lots of different people can, can work on. Okay. okay, so that was just one example of the sort of work that we do in my lab. We do a lot of other sort of work. Like I said, we work on different sorts of nanoscale devices. Um, everything from carbon nanotubes to, like I said, graphene, to nanoscale superconductors, to topological insulators. Uh, you can see all of these are just kind of nanoscale electronic devices. They're prototypes that we're just seeing what new physics is there. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, please feel free to look at my website to see other sorts of projects that we that we do in the lab. But, um, but you know, this is the this is really the heart of, of what I do. Okay, so that was that was the research part. And again, I'm happy to answer any researchy related questions afterwards. Um, but I now want to move on to just you know a little bit about my background and and how I got here and and what I, advice I have along the way, especially relevant to this QWIP conference. Okay, so how did I get here? So my background is I was born in New York City. I've lived in Washington D.C. I've lived in Houston. Um, you know, I lived everywhere, and I'm now I've been I've been, I've been in the Midwest longer than I've been anywhere else. But I was really born, you know, lived around the country. Um, in high school, I had a very strong interest in math. Really, from grade school, I used to do math problems just for fun. Um, but I didn't really have a strong physics background or science background. I just kind of liked math. Um, I did a lot of sports in high school. I was um, I was an elite level gymnast until um, through my eleventh grade or through tenth grade, and then I ran track um, in in high school and, and for a year in college. Um, in college, I, I, I went to Harvard. I, again, I didn't have a really strong science background. I'd basically taken one physics class in high school. That's it. And it, I wasn't great at it and it wasn't really a great class. And so I just liked thinking about physics. I liked the idea of it. And so I thought I might want to do physics, but then I didn't know I might want to do chemistry or biology or something else. And so I took all sorts of classes. I took math, I took chemistry, I took biology, I took physics in my first um, year at college or semester. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really, <laughs> I don't really like dealing with wet things. And so I, I didn't like the biology and chemistry all that much. It was a lot of um, memorizing molecules, which I didn't love. Um, in chemistry, especially, the only time it got really fun is when we started dealing with the periodic table and atomic orbitals and understanding how the shell fillings and all those things. And then it was really interesting. But then I realized that that was physics. And that's why it was interesting. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and, and physics, I really, I felt like it explained the world in a way that made sense to me. Just learning about that, you know, I remember learning about friction and understanding that the reason that you have friction at all is because of microscopic van der Waals attraction between, uh, between different materials. And that's, you know, it was an electrostatic reaction that gave that normal force, which is then what created all of these things. So, you know, understanding things at that fundamental scale from forces just, you know, that gives you, explains everything from, you know, credit card swipes to rainbows was something that just, I still find extremely interesting. So I just like to think about physics and decided to be a physics major. Um, a couple of notes about college. Many of you are, are, are in college right now. So um, one thing is that, is that, you know, physics is hard, um, especially when you're in college. It's, it's a hard major. It's not the sort of major that you can just sort of, at least I, I could, maybe for some of you it's easier, but I couldn't just you know, wait until 10 o'clock the night before and start my problem set and just kind of wing it, right? Or pull an all-nighter. And I couldn't just, uh, you know, bluff my way through exams. Not that you can do this in other fields, but okay, it was easier for me to do this honestly in like a political science course than it was ever to do it in physics. So physics is hard. You have to study. I spent a lot of time in, in the physics library. Um, but, you know, I, I did it because I was really interested in learning physics, and I knew that this is something that I wanted to understand better, to probably pursue as a career, and it was worth trying to understand it now to get the long-term benefit out of it. And I tell people this story that I remember being in college, and I, I'd be in the physics lobby, the physics library, which is great. I was in the physics library until late at night, many nights, and you know, it was two in the morning, and I was walking back to my dorm from the physics library, and I passed by this other dorm, and they had this 
in their common room, they had this big, you know, lit up window. And many times there'd be these guys there and they were just like playing pool and it'd be two in the morning and I'd be studying and they were just playing pool in the evening. And at some point I just looked at them and thought, you know, is this, is this fair that I'm studying all the time and they're just playing pool? And I thought, you know, I bet they're not physics majors because, you know, there's a reason I'm studying because I want to be a physics major and I understand that there's a little bit of sacrifice there, but I also understand the long-term benefits of that. So if you're in, in, you're in college and you find physics hard, just think of the long-term benefits and know why you're doing it for yourself. Uh, the other thing I say is to try to think about, try to figure out what's fun to think about and what you like best most of the time. I say this because many people, um, I remember being in college and people telling me that for feeling like I should be passionate about the thing that I was doing. And, and it, it worried me because I felt like passion was something where you were always jumping up and down and always excited about something and just always wanted to do it. And I like thinking about physics, but I didn't always want to do it. Um, and it took me some time to realize that, you know, I like to think about it most of the time. And I like to think about it more than other things. And if I figured out, if I knew that I'd like to think about it, you know, 80% of the time, then I was in really, really good shape. You know, if you can find something you mostly like to think about, then that's great. So, you know, I, I don't worry anymore about what I'm passionate about or what other people are passionate about. I just think about, do I really like to think about it most of the time? And if so, then that's great. Because if you'd like to think about something, you'll read about it, you'll think about it, you'll do better at it, right? You want to go into an area that you that you enjoy thinking about because that's the way you learn and get more, get more work and, and do better. So just think about what you like most of the time. It doesn't have to be all the time. You don't always have to love these things. And the final thing is that these summer research, research inter internships are really the most important factor um, for me in continuing in a career in physics. I was lucky enough to have uh, two summers at um, back then at at t Bell Labs, um, as well as some, some summers at a plasma physics um, fellowship and other things. These were, these were the chance for me to get into the lab and to do real work. I don't know about you guys, but for me, problem sets weren't all that fun. They were problem sets. You're, you're learning, you're doing problems. It's nice when you understand it. But if I had to make a career out of doing problem sets, I wouldn't be here today. And so, you know, it was really the hands-on internships when, when I, uh, that, that, that got me um, really, you know, realizing that I wanted to make a career working with my hands. That was just really fun. It was fun to think about projects, to follow through, to kind of just do experiments. And when I realized it was something that I could do for life, it was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, there's a question from Natalie about what year I was when I started doing research. I was actually really fortunate. Um, after, my, after my junior year of high school, I was invited to do a summer research um, experience in biochemistry at Rice University. Um, I think there's a special program for women and people underrepresented, which I, I benefited from tremendously um, over all these years. Um, but this program was biochemistry and I didn't, you know, my parents weren't scientists. And so I didn't really know what the life of a scientist was. It was my first time working in a lab. Um, and I just loved it. I loved going in and thinking of projects and being with other scientists and just like playing in the lab all day. Um, I didn't love biochemistry. <laughs> I realized that it just wasn't, you know, I, I just, yeah, it wasn't my, I had to go, it wasn't my favorite thing during biochemistry, but I did love lab work. And I think that's when I realized that I wanted to be able to do lab work for life. So that was, that was after my junior year of, of high school. And then I was able to do, um, you know, I did basically did summer internships every year since then. I did one in, uh, in, in, in geophysics, which I really, I really enjoyed the physics aspect. And then my sophomore year, I went to Bell Labs and in, in, that's in college. And that's the first time I did condensed matter. And that was what really sold me on, okay, I would like, I want to do this area. I want to work here. I want to do this work. I mean, I thought that was it. That's where, that was my goal after that, to be there and to work. Unfortunately, they kind of, uh, they weren't doing research in the same way by the time I finished my PhD. But, um, you know, that was, uh, that was my sophomore year that really made a difference. Um, you know, the, the, the same Natalie also says, is it, is it is it bad to start research as a sophomore or junior in college? And absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, I think that as long as you have some experience, I think so sophomore junior year is a, is a great year to start, is a great time to start doing research. Um, I just happened to have opportunities before then. But I think, you know, if you can get two research experiences in, 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 in college, that's really great. You know, even one over the summer and even one during the term or two summers or just something that, you know, it's, it's, it's good for, for graduate school and jobs, but I also think that summer research internships are really good to help you figure out what you want to do. 
because you know, how do you know you like condensed matter? How do I, I mean, it's, I had to go through biochemistry and geophysics and plasma physics and all these things to figure out that I really like condensed matter experiment best, you know, that I didn't like, that I didn't want to do theory, that I didn't want to do other things. So think of these experiences as not just, they're not just tools to get you to another place. They're tools to help you try to understand the field, what you like to do, what you're good at doing and what directions you want to go. So I think that starting your, your sophomore year um, in college is fantastic. If you start your junior year in college, that's great too, because you just need that experience, right? Just make sure you have at least one experience during research. Okay, so I went to graduate school after, um, after college. Um, you know, this is something that I actually thought about. I, I think that, um, you know, I, if you look at my resume, it looks like I just did physics all the way through. Like I went from, you know, a physics major in college to a physics graduate school to, a, you know, to, to physics postdoc to a physics professor. Okay, that's true. That's what's on paper. But that doesn't show you what I actually thought about. And I can tell you that every step along the way, I thought about whether I wanted to do the next step. You know, I thought about whether I wanted to be a physics major and actually, you know, played around with some things until I decided on that. I thought about whether I wanted to go to graduate school. I, you know, it wasn't clear to me that I definitely wanted to do it. Um, what I did realize is I wanted to get an advanced degree in some area. I thought that, you know, advanced degrees definitely lead to more stable, well-paid and more interesting positions. And, you know, I can see this in my friend, you know, some of my, my, my friends, kids now who have graduated from college and have gone straight into jobs. With a graduate degree, they expect you to think and they expect you to know how to think and to solve problems. And so usually you're put into positions where you're allowed to solve problems and think. If you don't have a graduate degree, you might get a well-paid job, but more often than not, you're just told what to do and you have to do that thing. And so for me, I knew that I really liked problem solving and wanted an advanced degree that at least showed others that I could problem solve. I did think of other professional schools. I thought if I wanted to go to law school or go to medical school or even business school, um, you know, I decided that, you know, Business wasn't really interesting to me, so I didn't do that. Um, I really was interested in medicine. I liked the idea of it, uh, but as I mentioned, I don't like squishy things in chemistry, so that got that got nixed. Law school would have been my second choice. I, I do like talking. Um, I like arguing, so I think that that would have been a, a good choice if I if I couldn't do science. Um, but honestly, I just thought the world maybe didn't need more lawyers. <laughs> I thought that going into science and physics, especially, that it was interesting and maybe I could have a bigger impact there than I would have in law school. And that was some, a factor in my just wanting to, to try it. And then finally, I was interested in research. I'd had these really good research experiences. I wanted to learn more about physics. I wanted to get more advanced training and just see how far I could go. You know, it wasn't clear to me that I was gonna be a professor. I didn't expect to be at all, right? It wasn't clear to me that I was even gonna succeed. I just thought, well, I have an opportunity. I should try this, okay? Um, and I did, and that was worth it to me. So. You know, if you're thinking about graduate school, I've written here some of what I think are the pros and cons of, of graduate school. Um, you know, the, the pros are, it can be, it's intellectually stimulating. You're thinking a lot. And, you know, this is, um, if you've ever been in a job or you don't get to think during the day, you realize the value of actually, you know, have, using your brain during the day. Uh, your, your, your schedule is flexible. You work a lot, but, you know, no one's telling you exactly what time to come in, what time to leave, whether you can go exercise it. 2 p.m. every day, you know, you can create your own schedule. You're in an academic community, which means people around you are still thinking and learning. Um, there's a lot of value in this and being around even historians or, you know, dancers who are getting master's degrees, people who are researchers in all these areas. It's a very, um, it's a really fun and intellectual environment to be in. A uh, PhD is powerful. What I mean by this is, again, it tells people you can solve problems. So, um, you know, I knew that no matter what I did after graduate school, if I had a PhD, it told people that like I was smart. You know, I didn't have to prove myself in, in anymore in some sense if I had this piece of paper, and that's that's worth something when you're looking at what to do next in life. And then, as I mentioned, I like doing science. I just like being in the lab. I, I like the practical aspects of science at least most of the time. This last one is something important because you know people think about what people talk about wanting to do physics. I've heard people talk about wanting to do physics. Um, and I've even had people who worked in a lab with me who liked the idea of working on experiments, but didn't actually like doing it. They got really frustrated or they got bored or it wasn't fun for them. And I'd always tell them, you know, you have to like the day to day. Otherwise, again, you're not going to be good at it. You're not going to devote your time to it. 
or at least you have to not mind the day-to-day -day when you do it. So I realized I like doing science most of the time and it was worth, you know, I, I wouldn't mind spending some more time doing it. The cons of graduate school is it's a lot of work for a long time. It's typically five to seven years um, and you are working pretty consistently. So, um, you know, it's taking a chunk out of your life just to get a PhD. Uh, you're not paid very much. Even, even in these days, they're trying to increase the graduate stipends. They're still, they're still much smaller than you could get with a job just out of, out of college. I will say that you know, you'll hear from many of us that we felt richer than we ever have um, in graduate school than any other time because our expectations are so low. <laughs> because you know, we just shared rooms and we had you know, crappy cars and all these things and no one really cared. So even though it's low pay, um, you know, we had pretty good lives. It is difficult to be pushed all the time intellectually. Um, you know, it, sometimes you want to take, it's, it's nice to give your mind a break, and you might also be tired of the ivory tower. So you have to think of which of these, how have these pros and cons work out for you? I do want to emphasize that if you don't want to do research, don't go to graduate school. Um, you shouldn't, you know, it is research focused. So if you like, think, you, know, you have to do something new, right? You have to actually do a new project. If you don't like doing that, don't go there just for the idea of graduate school, because there is a project associated with that. For me, I found it, I found it definitely, definitely worth it. Uh, let's see, there's a question here about how I dealt with the stress of going into a competitive field, um, as well as the stress of having lots of work and low pay. Um, so I'm going to talk about stress at the end. So Natalie, if you don't mind, there's a question about, about, about how I dealt with the stress. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the end of my talks. I have some, I'm going to talk about some of the things I don't like, and stress is included in there, and some strategies. And then if I don't answer it, please come back and ask me again at the end. Okay, and then, so I decided to go to graduate school. Um, like I said, I found I found it worth it to, to do it. I would think of the choices I made were good for me. Um, I went to Stanford. My thesis was on a superconductor metal insulator transition in two dimensions. Um, I chose to work in condensed matter experiment. Again, I chose this area of research because I'd had these great summer research experiences in this area. And I just thought about it, read some papers, even popular papers. I liked thinking about this topic. I went there and planned to work with one professor. He even had my desk ready when I came. I was super excited about it. Um, I got there. I after a month, I realized I wasn't interested in the project. I didn't like reading papers. I didn't like thinking about it. Um, I felt really bad, but I ended up switching to a different professor and then I was really happy. So it's okay if you don't know exactly what you wanna do when you get there. Um, and finally, you know, I realized that you know, graduate, school, <laughs> graduate school can be hard and frustrating. And then one day you discover it can be fun. So you know, I, was in, I remember being in my third year of graduate school and nothing was working. I had no data. I didn't even have devices that worked. I, I didn't, I was setting up a system that wasn't finished being set up. And I'd been there for three years, right? I'd been there for three years. And I'd finally kind of I'd half set up this system and I was kind of getting devices, but I just had no data. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to leave graduate school in like another two years. And I'm the first graduate student to leave who doesn't even have data. It's not even like not published and bad. I just, I'll have nothing. And I was sure of that. And it was super frustrating. And I was really sad. And I was just working so hard all the time. Um, and this was, you know, through my third year. And then, I don't know, my fourth year, something just switched and, you know, the devices worked and I started getting data and we started writing papers and it was super interesting and I knew what I was doing and I became a senior member of the group and we were doing all this stuff and getting all this work out. It became really, really cool. And, uh, and then I had to graduate. So when you get to graduate school, just remember this through your third year, it's very likely going to be hard and frustrating. And then one day it's going to work and it's going to be really fun. So have faith in the process. Um, if it's a couple of questions here. Okay. Okay. So I did a, a postdoc at Harvard. Um, I've been faculty at University of Illinois since then. Um, I know it's been 18 years since I started at Illinois because I started with a, a five month old. And, uh, you know, there she is now. She's going off to college this year. So <laughs> I, uh, I've been, a, you know, it's been a pretty stable for the past. Uh, 20 years almost. Okay, so was this always a, a, an obvious clear-cut path? The answer is no, at least for me, in my mind. I didn't always know what I wanted to do. I thought about it really hard. You know, do I always want a career in physics? No, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I just, you know, I liked, I did things, so I liked doing them along the way. And at every choice stage, I thought more about what I wanted to do. And am I always excited? And, you know, am I always saying like, physics is the best thing ever. It's the only thing I want to do. Do I wake up in the morning every day seeing like, you know, I only want to think about physics. You know, the answer is no. <laughs> there are times when I don't want to think about physics at all, right? Um, you know, so all of these things aren't true all the time. But if you ask, am I happy with the choices I made? Do I like the job I have and, and the path I've, I've, I've taken? The answer is absolutely yes. 
right? I really, really enjoy being a physics faculty, doing the work I do, interacting with people the way I do. And I'm very happy that I made the choices that I did. Okay, so so what are the things that that I do? Make sure I'm very good on time. Okay, well, I'll okay, I'll, I'll finish up quick because I know that we only have, we want to leave some more time for questions. Um, so some of the things I do, I do a lot of things. I'm director of Materials Research Center, also director of the Beckman Institute. I mentor graduate students, undergraduates, high school students. I teach classes. I write papers, give talks, write grants, do a lot of service to the field, like the Quantum Advisory Board, Defense Sciences Study Group. A lot of services to the community, um, including like you know gender equity councils, a lot of diversity talks, things like you know BBC show and TED talk. Um, it's really crazy at times. <laughs> we do, there's just a lot of things all the time, but it's also just interesting, engaging, really exciting, and things like outreach and service are really integral to what I do. I don't feel like they're just set asides. Like oh, I also do service. One of the reasons I like being a physicist, and one of the reasons I chose to do be an academic physicist, is because I get to engage more with students and I get to reach out to the community and give back. So what do I like about my position? I, I like doing research, as you, as you could probably tell from the beginning. Um, you know, I, you know, research is cool. You get to think about a problem. You get to think of ways of answering your problem, testing hypotheses, and then you get to figure out something new or useful. So that's, that's great. There aren't many chances in life you get to follow through on something like that. Um, now I'm doing a little more administration. I'm directing the Beckman Institute um, as well as an NSF um, MRSEC. Um, these are cool because they allow me to think about and enable a lot of different research. So it's not just my research. I get to think about really making a difference on a broader scale, which is that you know, at this stage in my career, I've done a lot of things and I really like, it's, it's fun for me to think more broadly and think about what how I can help even a bigger group do more things. It just helps society in different ways. Um, I should mention that our MRSEC has an an REU program. So uh, I don't know if I think we're, we're just at the deadline, very close. So if you're still looking for an REU program, please apply to the Illinois MRSEC. Um, I generally just really like my job. I, you know, it's a large variety of work. I get to focus on teaching and research and what's interesting, pretty well paid. I set my own schedule, social, there's travel, there's outreach opportunities. It's not always easy. You know, it's really hard to be, to do new things all the time and have new ideas. But again, for me, this is an environment that I really like working in. Uh, I like giving back and reaching out. Um, I really do believe that everyone should have the opportunity to follow their interests and talents. And you know, if each of us even can make a difference to one person, you know, that can still have a big effect. And when we talk about being underrepresented and think about how many of us are the only woman in our class or the only person of color in our class, imagine if there is just one more person there all the time, right? So you know, all of us, everything we do, if it impacts even one person can make a big difference in, in each of their, each of our lives. And to me, that's, that's really, that's really worth trying to do. Okay, um, the last five minutes I'll take, I'm going to talk about some things that I don't like in physics. And then I'll, if you guys have more questions about that, we can talk about it. So, you know, there's a bunch of things I don't like. Um, I'll go so, through some of these one by one. You know, one is imposter syndrome. This is a, uh, this is this persistent fear of being publicly exposed as a fraud, of not deserving the success we've achieved. Interestingly, this is very high, common among high achievers, right? And it, and it leads to a constant, this, you know, constant doubt, stress, burnout. Um, you know, I, a lot of women I know talk about feeling, having imposter syndrome. You know, the first person who ever came to my office telling me that he had severe imposter syndrome was a white male, interestingly. So, you know, this happens to a lot of people. Um, you know, related to this is a stereotype threat where our performance is based on what we think our capabilities are. So sometimes if you're a woman, you can do worse just writing your gender on a math test. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, I've had my, my own experiences with this, you know, thinking that I, that I just like failed my qualifying exam because I, and I had to leave physics and when I was in graduate school and just crying on my bed and knowing that I just wasn't good enough to do it and had to leave. And then finding out later that I passed the exam and it was fine. I could just go back to work. You know, what I realize at these points is that a lot of this, it's in our heads, right? I mean, people will, will say things to us, but, but we, it, it's really, we need, to, we need to be able to judge ourselves appropriately. Um, and the way to do this is to really to find role models, including our peers, who support us and believe in us. This is really important. I mean, I'm a great believer of peer role models, like the ones you have at meetings, um, who just kind of normalize things for us. We don't feel like, you know, we're alone in all these things. Uh, working hard, judging ourselves on our, on our priorities, judging ourselves on our results, um, meaning that, you know, it doesn't really matter what people tell you. What matters is what you do, what you contribute. And focusing on our priorities and what we want for ourselves, not what others 
want, want for us. And, you know, I want to take just one more second to talk about this because I find, especially among a lot of young women in physics that I interact with, people tell us or tell you and me that we don't belong. You know, people will say things like, you only got that position because you're a woman. You only got that internship because you're a woman. Now, they don't know. They don't know the selection criteria. You know, if it's so easy for women or people of color, why aren't there a million or tons of us in the field? Right? It's not It's not so simple and so easy. And they don't say the same thing to people who are legacies or people who, you know, have gotten, you know, whose advisors treat them like their younger sons because they remind them of themselves. Nobody knows what the criteria are, what other people have advantages are. When they say things like you got this because you're a woman, it's just from a position of ignorance. And for you, it doesn't matter why you got what you get, because all that matters is that Someone used selection criteria, you got something, and now you do with it what the, you do the best you can do. So whenever I'm in a position, I never worry about how I got there or what other people decide or think of me. I think about what I want and what I want to do with my position. And that's all that really matters once we get to a place. Okay, related to this is, is isolation, standing out, feeling alone, you know, being the only one when you walk into a room, as well as bias, both implicit and explicit bias. And for these things, again, you know, find mentoring, um, find support, you know, know that you're not alone in this. Life isn't always fair. I hate to say it, but, you know, but we can, you know, we can at least have people who support us. And then we focus on our goals and do our own work. Balancing family and career. Um, as I mentioned, I had two kids during, you know, during my tenure years. It wasn't easy. Uh, it's really important to know what's important to you to prioritize things, you know, decide you know, there is, you know, having kids takes time. I will say that, you know, and, and having families takes time and even having partners takes time. And it's up to each of us to decide, you know, how we want to balance that time. And if we're willing to risk one thing over another, I, for me, I felt like I was willing to risk not getting tenure because I wanted kids more. And I hate to say that that's a choice we sometimes have to think, but for me internally, I knew where my priorities were. So I wasn't stressed about it in the same way. I worked really hard, but I wasn't really as stressed. You know, it's in planning, organizing is really important, realizing your time is your most valuable resource, and just realizing that, you know, long term, you know, we have 40 year, 50 year careers ahead of us. So when we take a few years to have kids, and if it's, even if it slows us down, it's okay, right? We have a long career ahead of us. And then finally, stress. I mentioned stress early on. Stress is one of the most worrisome things. Stress is really, um, stress can be um, a killer, literally, right? It, 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 it harms us physically and it harms us mentally and it sucks the joy out of our lives. And these positions, research, physics can be stressful because it can be hard and we, you know, we can be isolated and there can be bias. There's a lot of things that can be very stressful. It's just, you know, being in this field can be stressful. And the, the other way, I, you know, again, I'm going to come back to the same themes of how to deal with this is really, you know, planning ahead. I mentioned this because sometimes we get stressed because of time issues and just being organized and planning and knowing when we're going to fit things in can help and knowing what things we can't do can help. Prioritizing what's important, focusing on long-term, realizing that what we think of as failure for stress because we think of something as failure, it's not failure, right? Things are, things can be, we can, we can shift directions. We can have new opportunities. We can just not do things. It's not, failure is not not a valid term in some way, right? It, it's just, it's not worth being stressed about that sort of thing because it doesn't exist. Change exists, but failure not in the same way. I mean, then we have to take care of ourselves. Take care of our physical health, physically, our emotional health. We can't do anything unless we're healthy. Okay, so let me end with uh, just uh, recapping my advice for thriving in STEM, working hard, doing what most interests you, planning ahead, prioritizing, being healthy, Swimming in your own lane. I have a story about this. I don't have time for that, but really it means focusing on your goals and priorities independent of what anyone else around you is doing. Block out the noise. And with that, I will thank you for your interest and uh, take any questions. Yay, <laughs> thank you so much, Nadia. That was an amazing, amazing talk. Um, and, uh, we, you know, please, we do have a few more minutes for questions. Um, I think some of the questions that had come in, you, you may have answered sort of yeah. kind of how to deal with stress. Um, while I wait for folks to type additional questions, I, there were a few questions that were asked, I think at the in-person conferences yeah. that I think might also be really good to ask here. Um, so you, you talked about the importance of mentorship and finding a mentor. And 
Do you have any advice on knowing whether a mentor is right for you or how to seek out a supportive mentor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I don't, I feel like, I feel like not, I feel like it's not a great idea to look for everything from one mentor. I think that it's, it, it's important for us to know what we want out of our mentor before we seek them. So the person who gives us moral support, for me, the people who give me moral support are my friends and my peers. And, you know, right now I still meet with a group of black women who are in different fields, but we meet like every month. They're also academics. And we talk about our experiences, about raising a family, about trying to navigate race and gender and families and academia and all these things. Those are the people I go to for that. I also have people I talk about science with, you know, people who are more experienced, who have been department heads, who can help me navigate, um, you know, writing grants, dealing, you know, getting requests for things. You know, the people I talk about science with are good people and they're thoughtful about things like race and gender, but their experiences aren't the same. And I don't tend to come with the same questions for them. So, you know, my advice is think about what we want from our mentors. Don't expect everyone to have all the answers and gather enough people around us that we can piece together the mentorship and advice and community that we need that can move us forward. That is excellent, excellent advice. Um, that's great. <laughs> um, another question that I uh, saw that I thought might be interesting to folks, and and uh, you know, to get to get to the concept of resilience, because I feel like that's another really important um, aspect yeah. of things. And so, one of the questions was, did you ever experience a like a breaking point or a point where you just were like, oh, I can't do this anymore? And how did you navigate that? What what was that like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I, I didn't, I, I fortunately didn't, I don't feel like there was a breaking point in terms of other people, at least when I was still in, in, in school so much, just because my feeling is this, I do things because I want to do them. If people want to kick me out, then they can do that, but I don't have to remove myself before I get kicked out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if, if I'm not going to make it through graduate school, then they can tell me that. Right. But, but I'm just going to keep working and plugging away and like doing my best until that time comes when it's like, you know, it's been five years and I have to leave or, or, or something else happens. Right. And same thing with tenure. I mean, it's like I was saying, having kids before tenure, I thought, okay, this is a risk. I may, it may not work, but I'm not going to not do it. Right. In the worst case, I won't get tenure. I'll get a job. I'll make more money. I'll have an easy life. It'll be fine. You know, so so part of the resilience is is from this understanding that I have my priorities and other people can't tell me what my priorities are or where I belong in any I mean they can, they can kick me out, but you know, but they can't at, at different stages along the way, I don't have to worry about their opinions so much and what what they're thinking. Um you know, the, the other thing is just a I think that we're all really resilient and it's not like I haven't gone home and just, you know, cried. I, mean, I don't cry very much, but every once in a while, you know, I remember I broke a sample three times in a row and lost like four months of work. And okay, I, went, I actually cried because it was really sad. And then, you know, I stayed home in bed that day. And then the next day got up and I went back to work because what are you going to do? Right. You, you can take, you need to take that time and be sad and be frustrated and be upset and talk to friends or talk to your therapist or go to the beach or take a week and then move on, move forward with our lives because we have to. And if something has to change, we have to figure that out too. Some of it is, I like to journal also. I should say that I keep notebooks. Like for a long time, I kept notebooks of just things I have to do, things I was thinking of, different strategies, because just writing it down takes it out of my head. So it takes it out of that loop. And it makes me think of like, okay, what do I need to do? What do I want? What's going to work moving forward a little bit? So, yeah. All great, great, great advice. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think many of us can reflect on that that one day when you're just, oh, yeah. So that's great advice. Um, so we're out of time. I have one more question. It's lighthearted because yeah. um, nothing is coming in. I, I, I um, um, If you could be a physics phenomena, what would you be? <laughs> I think I feel like I got this before. I I, I think I said elect. I mean, a, an electromagnetic field. So um, you know, electromagnetic fields they 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 permeate all of space and all of time. You know, they're waves. There's no beginning. There's no end. They're pure energy, right? Which is the basis of everything. And they give us light and rainbows and you know, lightning. Everything we love and see and experience is is controlled by this. So electromagnetic field. 
Absolutely. I love that answer. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, okay. Well, you know that we're right on time. Um, so th this is perfect timing. Uh, Nadia, thank you so much again for this wonderful talk. I really, really enjoyed. Oh, 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 no, there's a question coming in about how you use. Uh, are the letters of recommendations due as soon as the applications are due? Uh, are you programmed? So you have to look at you'd have to look at the application website. I think I think they're they're due if not if not as soon, maybe a day or two afterwards. I mean, pretty soon after. Yeah. Super. Yeah. OK. Good. Okay, awesome. thank you so much again. Thank you, everybody. And we're on to our next uh, sessions, um, which are breakouts into parallel sessions. So great. Thanks, Thanks Crystal. Good to see you. Thanks, to everybody. See you. Bye. Bye.